Okay, well, welcome everyone to an in-person real-life event, which some of us have missed for a very, very long time. Who knew we would miss it <laughs> until we missed it? So uh, it's been over two years since Juke Studies has had a public event, and I'm absolutely thrilled. I'm standing in here for Lisa Lampert Visek, uh, who's on leave this quarter, so you won't have me to kick around next year, just, just right now. So I want to give some introductions. First, to talk just a little bit about the accomplishments of our faculty. Uh, Lisa Lampert Visek has been publishing a range of topics on apocalyptic narratives and uh, in medieval history. Uh, she's the editor of an open access journal uh, called New Troster Studies, and she very much sends her regrets. Um, Mira Balberg, where are you? Some people may not know of our most wondrous addition to the history faculty, uh, and uh, she writes more books and chairs more committees than most of us can even imagine. Fractured Tablets, Forgetfulness and Fallibility in Rabbinic Culture, love those two Fs, Mira, um, which will come out with the University of California Press, and she's also been appointed to the editorial board of UC Press, where she will oversee publications on the ancient world. Uh, so uh, get in line for your submission. Okay, um, uh, Professor Tom Levy will be coming in and out because he teaches at this time. Uh, he has a new co-edited book, Preserving Cultural Heritage in the Digital Age. Um, he's been working on his at-risk world cultural heritage research. This quarter, the class he's teaching right now is called Global Archaeology, and he adds with over 80 students, which for us is a lot. Um, uh, the big uh, um, news uh, of Tom's life uh, is that he will retire on July 1st and he will become the distinguished professor of the graduate division um, and he will continue to supervise graduate students and we hope to be sending you news about a perennial task of Jewish studies professors, life could be a lot worse, and that's filling endowed chairs. So we'll be working on that next year. Amelia Glazer also sends her fond regards from, uh, uh, where is Amelia? In Boston, she'll be back at the end of June. She's at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. She told me because she's an expert on the Ukraine and because she's brilliant that hardly a day goes by when she doesn't give a talk somewhere. And she's busy organizing um, help for Ukrainian scholars. Her book, Songs in Dark Times, Yiddish Poetry of, of Struggle from Scottsboro to Palestine, uh, received the Jordan Schnitzler Association Jewish Studies Prize in Literature and Linguistics, um, and she's currently writing a book, is this hip or what? Contemporary Ukrainian Poetry. Um, uh, so Amelia will be back. Um, uh, my report is written on the back here of one of these. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm still laboring on a book that nobody thinks I will ever finish, but I know I will. Uh, <laughs> Visionaries, Lovers, and Mothers, uh, Radical Jewish Women from Conspiracy to Kibbutz. Um, I presented a lot of Zoom lectures from the Le Leobeck Institute in New York, the Einstein Forum in Potsdam, went to two conferences in Berlin. I, my big pedagogical news is, of course, that I uh, pioneered this winter, um, and my friend Professor Kalyali, wherever you are, helped me tremendously with it, uh, the history of two peoples in Palestine. And I had a very diverse group of students, and we had some truly, um, truly frightening and exciting and uh, amazing conversations. Okay, uh, two more comments before I turn it over to uh, Professor Seth Lair from the Literature Department who will introduce our speaker. So I just wanna say a couple of sentences. Week six of the quarter turned out to be a painful week on campus. Uh, this is not the time or place to go into every detail. I know that a lot of you are following every detail. I myself have great trust in the administration and in our wonderful students uh, to work towards more dialogue in the coming year. Now, when we academics see trouble in the present, we run to history books and we think we find solace and inspiration and help in those books. And no one is better suited uh, to drive this point home with her wonderful lecture uh, than Professor, uh, Professor Levy. Um, so I just have some thank yous. Uh, and let's have a round of applause for our wonderful staff, Anne-Marie, who did the signage, the catering, and standing next to her, Jen Schwartzkopf, who's our amazing, I don't know, she shepherds us. She tells us what we did at the last meeting and what we need to do at the next one. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Lair for agreeing to introduce the speaker. Um, and then I'd like to thank uh, Susan Lapidus for her wonderful work with the Gallen in Gallenson Institute, bringing us fabulous Israeli scholars. Um, and Suzanne Hillman, my assistant in the Holocaust Living History Project, who uh, is another arm of Jewish studies. Okay, that's it, thank you.
Well, it's my great honor today to introduce Professor Latal Levy of Princeton University as our Katzen lecturer this afternoon. Professor Levy's had a distinguished career as a scholar and as a teacher of the intersections among Jewish studies, Middle Eastern studies, languages and literatures, and what she calls global Jewish modernity. Central to her scholarship, for those of you who've had a chance to look at her remarkable book, A Poetic Trespass, is really the way in which traditional Judaic studies is relocated in the Arab-speaking world, in Sephardic identity, and in Israeli-Palestinian cultural relationships. This book, uh, which appeared in 2014, Poetic Trespass, won just about every prize it possibly could. Won the prize from the Modern Language Association, from the Association for Jewish Studies, from the American Academy of Jewish Research, it's really a book about relationships between Hebrew and Arabic, not just as literary languages, but really as forms of cultural and political power. And as I was preparing for this introduction, I was reading through the book, and there is a quotation that I would like to offer, which I think in many ways sums up the, the, the sort of the innovative brilliance of Professor Levy's reading of things. And this is what she says. The top-down creation of national languages usually entailed the repression of other languages or dialects. Nevertheless, the story of modern Hebrew is an exception in the audacity of its vision and forcefulness of its realization. In the case of Hebrew, one could say that it was not even the state that created the language so much as the language that created the state. It entailed not only linguistic centralization or the privileging of one language or dialect over others, but the reinvention of a traditional liturgical language as an all-encompassing, everyday spoken and written medium, carried out through the successful inculcation of a national monolingualism. I find this remarkable. I find this the best single paragraph summary of the development of modern Hebrew, a reimagination of language and politics, and also of the sacred and the secular and the past and the present. And this is the kind of work that Professor Levy does. I had a chance this morning to look at her remarkable article in a recent issue of Critical Inquiry, Temporalities of Israel, Palestine, Culture, and Politics. And I'm going to guess that her current research project is building on that work, looking at the ways in which we see not just a Jewish and Arab-speaking population, but as she is very interested in Arab-speaking Jews. And her talk today, I think, is going to reflect on these Judeo-Arabic relationships, on the figure of Esther Moyal, an early 20th century writer, social activist, whose impress on the modern Judeo-Arabic literary renaissance is indelible, but maybe all too unknown to many of us here. And so we're going to hear about a Sephardi feminist in the early 20th century, her literary legacy, her cultural impact, and the world of uh, her life her le her, and, and her legacy. So thank you very much, Professor Levy. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really moved by your generous reading of my book. Really, it um, means quite a lot to me to be read <laughs> like that. And thank you so much, Deborah, for the invitation, and to Lisa, who's not here, and um, to Jewish Studies, and of course, again, for all the logistical help, Anna Marie and Jen. Uh, I'm just really honored and delighted to be here, and it's so wonderful to be giving this talk in person amongst people. I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards. So um, I really want to encourage everybody not to be shy during the Q&A, whether you feel like you know a lot about this or don't know anything about this. I just welcome any questions on any aspect of the talk and really look forward to engaging with you. So I'll start with a bit of context. So as was mentioned, today we're going to be hearing the story of an important 19th century Jewish woman, an intellectual named Esther Azhari Moyal, who is not pictured here. But I imagine that if I asked you to think of famous Jewish female intellectuals from that period, maybe some of these pictures would be the ones that came to mind. Some names that you might think of Maybe they would include Emma Lazarus, for example, or Emma Goldman, or Henrietta Zold. 
Now what all those women have in common is that they were all born in either the US or Europe around the mid 19th century and they all played important roles in politics and culture in the US. Although you might not know it, Emma Lazarus happened to be also of Sephardic origin, descended from Portuguese Jews who were early settlers in the American colonies after their forebears had fled the Spanish Inquisition in Brazil. I'm sorry, for the Spanish Inquisition to Brazil and from there came to the US. Now the subject of our talk also happens to be a Sephardic woman and inter interestingly enough, one whose original family name probably shares a common origin with Lazarus and who therefore, this is just speculation, but it's possible may even have been a distant relative of Emma Lazarus. As opposed to Emma Lazarus, however, Esther Azhari's family had made its way from Spain or Portugal to the Ottoman Empire. And this means that while those two Sephardic women were contemporaries and possibly even relations, they made their respective intellectual contributions in two very different societies on opposite ends of the globe. And it also means that while most of you, I imagine, have heard of Emma Lazarus, I doubt that anyone here had previously heard of Esther Azhari Moyal. So Esther Moyal is indeed unique. As far as we know, she is the only Jewish woman writer in the modern Arabic Renaissance movement, known as the Nahda. And this is a cultural revival of Arabic language, literature, and thought that took place from roughly 1830 through the 1920s. Although she was fluent in both French and Arabic, and she could also read English and Hebrew, she wrote exclusively in Arabic. And this is due to her deep identification with the language and culture. And as we're going to see in some detail, she saw no contradiction between being Jewish and being an active participant in the Arabic sphere of letters. She had a remarkable career, and she was a significant female figure in the Arabic revival but until recently, she was largely forgotten by scholars. Now, while not all her activity was centered on her Jewish identity, her Jewishness did play an important role in her work, especially her later work, which we'll be seeing soon. So my talk today presents her life and times through the multiple spheres in which she was influential, including literary translation, Arab feminism, and the defense of European Jews. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a surviving image that we know is definitely hers, but since I hate to leave you without any way to visually imagine her, we can look at this image of a Moyal couple in Jaffa from around that time. So it is possible that this is an image of Esther and her husband, but it could also be another Moyal couple, that being a common name in Sephardic society in Palestine. But for our purposes, let us allow ourselves to imagine that this is her. Esther Azhari was born in Beirut in 1873 to a Sephardic family whose wanderings had led to Istanbul and then Palestine. Now the original family name was Lazari. That's the, Ara the Arabic or Arabicized equivalent of Lazarus, which is why I suggest that Esther and Emma may possibly have been distant relatives. The Lazari family resettled in Beirut in the mid 19th century. And then their name was changed from Lazari to the more Arabic sounding Azhari, because that's just how people heard it. So when they said Lazari, people heard Al Azhari, and then it became changed to Azhari. So she became, whoops, what happened here? So she became Esther Azhari. So Esther was the daughter of Abdallah Azhari, who was a Jewish silk scrap merchant. And silk was the dominant industry in Lebanon at this time. So quite a few people, if you learn about you know, intellectual life in 19th century Lebanon, there'll be connection to silk. Esther seems to have been something of a child prodigy. She reported later that as a child, she memorized the Quran and mastered the formal rules of its recitation and also studied the New Testament. These would have been really highly unusual achievements for a young girl at that time, let alone a Jewish girl. In fact, I have never heard of another Jewish girl who actually was exposed to this kind of teaching. She had formal training in Arabic, French, and English. At the age of 11, she started studying at the Syrian Protestant College, which is the institution that later became known as the American University of Beirut. 
and she was taught Arabic and English there by a respected Arab writer. After receiving her degree at the age of 17, Esther taught for a few years at local girls' schools. And in those years, she also became very active in the first local Syrian women's associations, and she made her first forays into literary translation. Now, Syria at that time incorporated what is now Lebanon. So although she was born and all of this is taking place in Beirut, she was considered a Syrian woman. At the same time, she is properly situated within the first wave of Arab feminists and women writers alongside Christian and Muslim women. So here is one of Esther's Muslim colleagues in this movement, the Syrian writer Hana Qurani. Women participated in the modern Arab cultural renaissance. They were insisting on their right to have a presence in this intellectual sphere. And they argued that educating women was necessary in order for women to be able to properly educate their own children and to manage their households. So they were not feminists in the sense that we know from you know, 1960s onward. You know, they were not arguing for equality of the sexes, but just for the simple idea that women had intellectual capabilities that needed nourishing and that deserved to be nourished. In 1891, at the age of 18, Esther joined the Don of Syria, one of the first Syrian women's associations, and two years later she was appointed its secretary. And in that capacity, she was also nominated to represent Syrian women at the 1893 World Fair in Chicago, along with her friend and colleague, Hana Korani, who we just saw a moment ago, although it's unclear if Esther ever made it there. So we don't know if she was there, but she was nominated to go. In 1896, she co-founded another society called the Women's Awakening, also in Beirut. So for these five years, from 1891 to 1896, she was making her mark mostly in the nascent Arab women's movement. Now, it was also in 1893, around this time, that her name began appearing in the pages of the Arabic press. And one of her first publications, a translation of an Alexandre Dumas novel, was printed in installments in a journal for women. Dumas, of course, is best known as the author of The Three Musketeers. So she was already making her mark also as a literary translator. But one of my favorite pieces of hers from this early period is her 1894 letter to the journal The Crescent Moon in Arabic Al-Hilal. This was the leading Arabic cultural journal of its time. It was like the New Yorker or the Times Literary Supplement of its day. So this is really interesting because it's actually the first signed contribution by any woman to this journal. Now what I mean by that is that other women had contributed anonymously but because it was considered so socially controversial in this period for a woman to publish, they didn't use their names, whereas Esther is bold enough to print it under her own name. So here, Esther responds to a previous letter that had been submitted by a male writer on the topic of the intellect of women, and she seems to be quite incensed. So she writes, I read the serial article included in your esteemed periodical signed by Dr. Amin Afendi Khouri. So that would have been the original author. She says, I don't know how it could be that the esteemed doctor places our gender on a par with horses, donkeys, and dogs. How much more appropriate it would have been had he left the birds of his pen in the cages of nightingales, canaries, and parrots. In all truth, I'm utterly flabbergasted. I dispute his claim that the mind of women is confined within a narrow circle. Howsoever, I turn my glance to the distinguished ladies who have honored me with their affection, I don't see the respected doctor's judgment applying to them. How often have I attended their meetings and heard their versatility in subjects ranging from the scientific to the religious and the philosophical? And how often have disputants competed before me, one of them belonging to the gender of the esteemed doctor, and the other one to our weak gender, that which is incapable of obtaining the doctor's regard. Proofs were exchanged, and the debaters moved from one topic to the other. And the woman was the grace of the debate, even if we don't call her the winner. And furthermore, I remind the esteemed doctor that women have not entered the door of scholarship and belles lettres until recently, not due to any shortcomings of their own, but rather because of the strong sex's disdain for them. The mocking of educated women by the famous French poet Molière and others suffices as a just witness to my words and supports my claims. So as you can see, 
The young Esther Azhari was an outspoken advocate for women with a bold and fiery writer's voice. While her passion for the women's cause is clear, it's ultimately her personality that gives life to her argument. From imagining her opponent's mother's versatility in the household realm to the poignant description of her female colleague's intellectual versatility in the debate room, a scene that she describes with so much affection, Moyle draws a clear line of female aptitude. And the letter's creative flourishes, in which Moyle opposes the horses, donkeys, and dogs, with nightingales, canaries, and parrots of the writer's pen, show her skill as a writer. Now, her early journalistic and feminist activity in these years, when, again, she was only in her late teens and early 20s, right? She was still quite young when she was writing this. It was seen as so remarkable that two different items about her appeared in the Paris edition of the New York Herald. So here is a close-up. This was the, whoops, sorry, this was the full page, and now I'm showing you each of these items about her in red, a closer look. The first one on the left appeared in March 12, 1892. And this is a reprint of a letter that um, a writer named Salim Sarkis, he signs it S.S. Sarkis, he was then the editor of Lisan al Hal, the mouthpiece, which was a Beirut-based newspaper founded in 1877, and one of, the most, uh, one of the earliest and most influential Arabic journals of the time. He had contributed this about her, and here he asks the Herald to include Syrian women in their essays on the political condition of women. So in his letter, Sarkis highlights the contributions of Esther Azhari to his own newspaper, as well as mentioning her literary translations. And then he followed it up with another piece a couple uh, months later from June 1892, this one called The Emancipation of Syrian Women. And here he complains that the censor in Beirut is prohibiting anything being written by or about women in the Syrian newspapers. So he's hoping that his protege, Esther Azhari, will start publishing in the leading Egyptian journal called Al Ahram, The Pyramids. This newspaper, by the way, still exists to this day. And so um, this phenomenon where this is an Arab journalist who's talking about moving from Beirut to Egypt due to the more permissive censorship conditions in Egypt, this is a larger phenomenon. And indeed, Esther would go on to publish in some of the other major Arabic newspapers and journals of the time, including Al Ahram, and she herself would move to Cairo, as we'll see shortly. Now, sometime during these early years, Esther Azhari made the acquaintance of Shimon Moyal. Shimon was a Jewish student from Jaffa who had also become active in Arab intellectual circles, and he was studying medicine in Beirut at the time, so they met there. So Esther and Shimon were engaged in 1893 and married in 1894, and these again are the years when she's starting to publish in the journals and she's really active in feminism. And then the couple moved to Istanbul, which was the center of the Ottoman Empire, right, the imperial center, because Shimon was obtaining his medical license. In 1896, he received his license, and then they started moving around a lot, so they were in Palestine, in Safad, known in Hebrew as Tzfat, in Tiberias, and then back in Beirut. And finally, in 1899, they resettled in Cairo. And so there, in fact, um, they did join the large community of Syrian intellectuals and writers who had migrated there, largely for the reasons mentioned earlier in Sarkis's letter to the Herald, because of the greater degree of intellectual freedom and the better publishing conditions. So that same year, 1899, Esther is now a young mother, but that didn't slow her down. She founded her own periodical, the bi-monthly Al Aila, or The Family, which ran for about five years. The family was widely circulated in Egypt and beyond. In its opening issue from May 1st, 1899, Moyal presents the journal's purpose as a conduit of communication for educated women in Egypt and Syria, writing that it would be, quote, she's, she writes, a link of literary camaraderie between them and a medium for relaying their opinions, where the horses of thought can race to reach the last word in matters related to the family and society, such as child rearing and education, and the harmony of the household and its management. But the content was also to include, quote, a literary scientific section featuring articles by Eastern writers and translations of the work of Western women intellectuals, 
followed by a, quote, family-oriented section featuring advice on raising children with some details on handiwork and household economics. <laughs> and finally, humor and entertainment featuring the most delicious of novels, histories, and jokes, followed by announcements of gatherings and festivities. So she was trying to cover all bases, essentially, from how to take care of your children to reading works by uh, Western women intellectuals, and um, finally, some, some more entertaining uh, selections. Contributing writers in the first year also included a number of notable Arab men. So that's also interesting that they felt it was appropriate to publish in a journal for women. Now, while the issues from the first year focused primarily on questions of mother-child relations, health, hygiene, nursing, and education, Moyal also printed lengthy features on world affairs which was a typical of women's publications at the time. And furthermore, this was a newspaper aimed at a general Arabic readership, but it occasionally discussed Jewish matters. So for instance, in an edition from August 1904, Moyal praises a new history of the Jewish people in Arabic that was written by a Christian author, Shaheen Makarius. Also, in an article on the topic of breastfeeding, Moyal quotes Rabbi Akiba, the famous second century Palestinian rabbi and legal authority who's considered the father of rabbinic Judaism. And in this quote she says, she quotes him as saying that the mother who declines to nurse her own child is no better than a barren woman. So it's interesting that she invokes Rabbi Akiba as a source of authority for an article that's aimed at contemporary Arab women who are not Jewish. Now alongside journalism, Literary translation was another important facet of the modern Arabic cultural revival. Through translation, they were able to enrich the language and familiarize readers with the conventions of the Western story and novel. Moyal may have been the most prolific female translator of Arabic of her time, with about a dozen French novels to her credit. So in one article for her newspaper called The Eastern Renaissance, she laments the one-sided translation practice of importing European works into Arabic. And she calls for the reverse, translating Arabic writings into European languages. Now, this is the cover of her 1907 translation of Emile Zola's novel L'Argent, or Money, which she titles in Arabic El Mal, El Mal, El Mal, which is surprisingly idiomatic in English as it translates to money, money, money. And additionally, she translated dozens of short dramas from French to Arabic to be staged at local Arab schools, and in particular, at the National Jewish School, which was an Arabic language Jewish boarding school in Beirut. So this indicates that she has a long-standing interest specifically in the works of the French writer Emile Zola. And her most significant achievement from these years, which we're gonna be now looking at in some depth, is her 1903 Arabic language biography of Zola, the French writer, who's pictured here. Zola was born in 1840 and died in 1902. And as far as I know, her biography of him is her only original book-length work. She has you know, all the translations, but this is her only original, um, long original work. Now, in the introduction to her biography, Moyel explains that she was inspired by Zola's famous defense of Alfred Dreyfus, the French Jewish army captain falsely accused of espionage in what came to be famously known as the Dreyfus Affair. And later in the book, she calls Zola's intervention in the affair, quote, the most significant event in Emile Zola's life. So we will be delving into this now. The Dreyfus Affair was a major event that rocked Europe and had profound implications for modern Jewish history, including the emergence of political Zionism. The affair erupted in 1894 when Alfred Dreyfus, the officer, was charged with passing state secrets to Germany. Dreyfus was hastily court-martialed, convicted of high treason, stripped of his rank, publicly humiliated, and paraded before a crowd shout shouting anti-Semitic slurs. He was exiled for life to Devil's Island, but throughout it all, he maintained his innocence. And in fact, within a few years, evidence of a military cover-up began to surface. 
sparking a massive public controversy about French democracy and anti-Semitism. The affair shook France to its core and raised a maelstrom in the European press. And the case bitterly divided France into two camps, one progressive supporters of Dreyfus and the other pro-army, mostly Catholic opponents of Dreyfus. And Moyal refers to them as clericalists because she's talking about um, the French clergy. Now, this is where Zola comes in. So the affair begins, again, to remind you, in 1894. Okay? And then on January 13th, 1898, the writer Emile Zola famously rose to Dreyfus's defense in his open letter to the president of the French Republic, Jacques, or I accuse, which became a turning point for public opinion on the affair. Now, in this letter, Zola directly blames the French army for its cover-up of Dreyfus's false conviction. The letter was a bombshell. It caused a massive uproar that reverberated around the world. Following the letter's publication, supporters of the French military sued Zola for libel, and he was brought to trial in February 1898, and he was found guilty and sentenced to a year's imprisonment and a fine of 3,000 francs, but he fled the country to England. As a result of Zola's open letter and all the new attention to the case, however, Dreyfus had a retrial, and he was still found guilty, but even though he was found guilty, he was pardoned by the president of the republic. Now, Dreyfus was ultimately exonerated in 1906 and reinstated to the French army, but his case remained a notable example of French and more broadly, European anti-Semitism. The Dreyfus affair gripped the public imagination of the entire world. Initially, the case didn't attract much notice in the Arabic press, but towards 1896, as public doubts grew concerning France's handling of the case, it began receiving more attention in Arabic. The Arabic press covered important aspects of the case, such as the military's attempts to protect the actual culprit, who was named Esterhazy, as well as the heated debates in the French parliament and the prone anti-Dreyfus camps in the French public and press. So the coverage in the various Arabic newspapers, uh, it reflected their different political orientations and social outlooks, particularly as concerned their attitude toward Jews. So for example, reporting by the Beirut-based Catholic newspaper Al-Bashir, which was generally anti-Jewish, remained continuously hostile to Dreyfus even after the revelations of 1897 and 1898, which had led to a major shift in public opinion and worldwide calls for a retrial. By contrast, um, there's, you could look at two other papers. The pro-French Al-Ahram, the Egyptian newspaper we mentioned earlier, took a kind of cautious middle line. And then the pro-British al muqattam supported Dreyfus. And that used the case as a platform to criticize the hypocrisy of the French Republic with its claims of equality for all of its citizens. Now, a particularly noteworthy case is the Islamic, famous Islamic reformer, Rashid Rida's stance in support of French Jewry in his Islamic paper Al-Manar, or The Lighthouse, in which he made an explicit appeal to Arab writers to halt the tide of anti-Semitism rolling into the East from France. And just to repeat that, that was in an Islamic paper. So Rashid Rida is a very famous figure from the 19th century who was in what was known as the Islamic reform movement. And so he took it really as an opportunity to try to address the kind of mood, these anti-Semitic tendencies that were actually moving into the Middle East from France. Ultimately, for the Arab world as elsewhere, the Dreyfus Affair became a defining moment in the development of modern journalism, in which the newspaper emerged as a tool of critique and as an arena for exposing corruption and demanding reform. In a recent article, the historian Orit Bashkin also discusses pro-Dreyfus writings in the books of Iraqi and Ottoman intellectuals and in a Ladino journal by the Salonican Sephardic journalist Sam Levy. In Bashkin's analysis, the Arab intellectuals who commented on the affair took it as a sign of the decline of France. And this brings us to Moyal's book. So <clears throat> this is the cover of her book. And her writings really offer us a unique window onto the reception of the Dreyfus Affair by these Jewish writers who straddled 
both the Arab world and the larger Jewish world. Her book, whose cover page is here, and her commentary in her journalistic writings are the sole surviving expressions of an Arab Jewish perspective on the affair. Now, Moyal's biography of Zola is also quite notable for what it shows us of her immense erudition in classical Arabic and in the Islamic heritage. So for example, in the book's introduction, she quotes the poetry of Abu Tayyib al-Mutanabbi, the 10th century Arab poet, who's considered the gold standard of classical Arab po Arabic poetry. So in general, like other good Arabic writers of the period, Moyal writes using, drawing on the cultural stock of the Arabic language and its classical heritage and repertoire. So she quotes freely from the Quran. Again, not, not because you know, she, she herself is Jewish, but because the Quran is really the central part of Arabic culture. So to be a cultured person in the Arabic language means that you can quote from the Quran. So let's look at some representative prose from the introduction. So for example, she writes, Zola has died, and his death was announced to the people the morning after they read his letter. That letter, free of doubt, was a guide to the judiciary and a light revealing truth and dispelling falsehood. And then in Arabic, that last sentence reads, ذلك الكتاب لا رايبا فيه هدى للخداء ونور أزهر الحق فأزهق الباطل. So that line, uh, that book or letter, could be free of doubt. And she's actually referring there, um, when she says that letter, she's talking about Jacuz. She's talking about um, the open letter that Zola had published. So um, this line here is actually quoting um, from Surat al-Baqarah, the cow, which is the second chapter of the Quran. And then she combines it with the next part, which says the light revealing truth and dispelling falsehood. That alludes to another chapter of the Quran entitled Banu Israel or Al Isra, the children of Israel. So she's kind of freely taking these verses from the Quran and combining them and inserting them into her prose. Now, Moyal's deployment of these verses from the Quran within a secular text can be seen as expressing a kind of cultural Islam. It's her way of signaling, I am Jewish, but as an Arabic language literary writer, this is my literary culture. My literary culture is Islamic. And using this Arabic language that's so rich in these Islamic references, she expresses her viewpoints about the Dreyfus affair. And she's being extremely critical of French anti-Semitism. So in a sense, her writing is both very Jewish and very Islamic. Right? It's Jewish in its content and its interest, and it's Islamic in the language and the style. And so it may seem surprising to us today, but in her own time and space, she seems to be equally comfortable quoting lines from the Quran and invoking Rabbi Akiba. Now, the rest of the Zola biography is compiled mostly from her reading of the French and English press, and it covers all aspects of Zola's life and literary career, but it devotes significant attention to the Dreyfus affair. So we'll take a deeper dive into um, the sections on the Dreyfus affair. The book's four longest chapters are those devoted to Dreyfus. So she has a whole chapter on Jacuz, which she translates into Arabic in its entirety. She has a chapter on the trial of Zola and the responses to his death. And throughout these chapters, she takes a strong position in support of Zola and against the French clerics who were supporting the French military and its cover-up. But she's also very cautious not to establish any claims that she can't substantiate. So keep in mind, that the book is published in 1903. So Zola dies in 1902. The book is published in 1903. And Dreyfus, at this point, is still not exonerated. He was not exonerated until 1906. And so she didn't know, at the time she wrote this, how it was going to end up. So for example, she writes, after this brief summation of the history of the Dreyfus and Esterhazy cases, let us furnish the reader with our opinion on the reason for du petit du clam's accusation of treason. He's the guy who first accuses Dreyfus, right? His accusation of treason against Dreyfus, and for his persistent efforts, along with the other clericalist officers, to have Dreyfus convicted and sentenced. However, before we explain our view of that matter, we must state that we do not seek to impose it upon the reader as the truth, because the verdict has not yet faced the true judgment of history since most of its actors are still alive and some 
even still in their posts. Thus, the door remains open to conjecture and surmise. So she's being very careful here. And then she continues, what we do say is this. It is evident that any particular faith whose members do not have judges of their own denomination in the country in which they have made their home will have a very great interest in legitimate democratic laws prospering there. Only this will ensure that this particular community may participate in government with any true authority, since they are a part of society with the constitutional rule of law that grants its members the right to vote. So here in this section, Moyal gets at the heart of the intrinsic association between democratic government and minority rights and representation. She understands that the best protection any minority community has is going to be in ensuring the health of its democracy. And from here, Moyal goes on to assert that the members of such a minority community, quote, will give their votes only to those parties that can advance their community's fortunes and support the government. This prevents them falling prey to the forces of arbitrary rule and preserves a constitution that requires civil equality between all the faiths of the nation. This is the case with the Israelites in most of the countries of Europe. So again, what she's saying essentially is that this system of government is essentially a contract that secures the rights and status of the minority community and saves them from authoritarianism or despotism. But at the same time, the minority community also supports the Republican form of government, and that's healthy for the civic constitution of the nation as a whole. And so then she goes on to talk about how the Jews of France are sometimes courted by politicians when votes are hanging in the balance. And she even calls French Jews the greatest supporters of the Republican principle. And this, she says, is why the clericalists, again, the anti-Dreyfus people, why they hate the Jews. Because the clericalists want to restore the monarchy in France and see the Jews as obstacles to that goal. So as a result, she says, the clericalists seize upon the opportunity to accuse Dreyfus of treason in order to demean the Jews in the eyes of the other faiths and to prove that the Republican system of government is weak since it systematically requires that Jewish rights be preserved. So she basically gets at the heart of what was behind it all, which she basically sees as you know, this kind of political contest um, between the monarchy and the republicanists where Jews are kind of at the fulcrum. So I quote these sections of the book at length because they're representative of Moyal's lucid and penetrating understanding of the major events of the time and their broader implications, not only for the future of Jews in France, but for Jewish citizens everywhere, and really for the future of democratic representative government, which is under threat. Now in other parts of the book, she gets into some granular detail in her analysis of all the different players in the Dreyfus affair, but from a distance, what really stands the test of time is that clear-headed identification that she presents of why this matters so much. And moreover, her presentation of those ideas and arguments in beautiful classical Arabic for the general Arab reader. And here and throughout the book, she continues to pepper her prose with couplets of classical Arabic poetry that emphasizes her points, and that was a mark of high style in Arabic. So throughout the book, her voice is passionate, and urgent, and she never minces words. She calls out the perpetrators of injustice, and she reflects on the courage that's needed to stand up to the forces of oppression and to speak truth to power, which is exactly what Zola had done. So Zola's death was a whole other matter, right? Zola, um, he dies tragically by coal gas poisoning, but there are many people who claim that he was murdered, and we won't get into that, but that's how Zola dies in 1902. So after discussing his death and its aftermath and then the responses in the European and Arabic presses, she closes her book with a report on establishments of memorials, monuments, and libraries in Zola's name. And in a special section that's devoted to the reaction of Jewish communities worldwide, Esther states that the Dreyfus Affair was, quote, in actuality, not the case of one man, but of the entire Jewish people. And she says it's part of a greater struggle against clerical prejudice and injustice. Now this section is interesting also because it offers a tangential, yet very intriguing string of references to various European Zionist organizations and activities. 
And this indicates that Moyal was closely following developments in that area as early as the turn of the 20th century. So for example, she writes that in a French newspaper, she had read a lengthy address by someone who she refers to as Zanwil, which possibly means the British Jewish author Israel Zangwil, for a ceremony marking Zola's funeral that she says was, quote, held at a sitting of the Zionist Charitable Association in Paris. And she then says that, quote, many Zionists discussed the idea of establishing a permanent memorial to Zola, and that a Zionist organization in Paris collected a very large sum in his name. And she also discusses another Zionist association in Vienna. And then finally, she uh, discusses the Jews of Egypt and Palestine, saying that the Israelites of Alexandria showed the love and respect that is in their hearts and held a gathering for the occasion. And they discussed a means of commemorating Zola. And she says, I have also heard that the Israelites of Palestine are planning on establishing a free public library in Zola's name. And it will hold his works in all the languages in which they've been translated. Now, all these open references to Zionist activity are quite remarkable when we think about the context of their publication. This is a book appearing uh, in Cairo in 1903 for a general Arab readership. So although Zionism was already beginning to be debated in the Arabic press, her approach here seems to indicate that it's not yet the hot button topic that it would become by 10 years later in 1913. Certainly it wouldn't have been perceived as just kind of neutral commentary to be discussing all of these various Zionist organizations by then. So this brings us to uh, the story of the Moyal couple again and their return to Palestine. So they had been in Cairo at the time the book was published and then not long after the Young Turk Revolution, in either 1908 or 1909, they moved back to Jaffa. And there they became very active in local politics. And their political brand was quite distinctive. So on the one hand, they were really committed loyal Ottomanists. What does that mean? That meant that they supported the continuation of Ottoman Turkish rule over the region. But at the same time, they were also strongly in favor of Jewish settlement in Palestine. Now, they envisioned a homeland for both Jews and Arabs, but within an Ottoman political framework, meaning this is, again, this is also early, right? This is 1908, 1909, but that they're in no way talking about the establishment of a separate independent state for Jews. They also felt strongly that the new European Jewish immigrants who are arriving should themselves assimilate culturally into the region and learn Arabic, rather than having Palestine become an outpost of Europe in the Middle East, such as Herzl and other European Zionist leaders had advocated. Now, this would be entirely a losing battle, but it is one that is important to note historically. So during this time, Esther was still contributing articles to the Arabic press and still active in women's issues. She founded another women's organization. She edited a Jaffa-based Arabic newspaper called Al-Akhbar, The News, and she continued to write on women's issues in a wide variety of venues and give a lot of presentations and speeches in Jaffa and elsewhere. So of note um, is a 1911 graduation speech delivered in Beirut at the American School for Girls in which she speaks vigorously about challenges for women in the Arab East in the new century, and in particular about the necessity for a proper education for Arab women comparable to the education that's available to Western women. Now, this speech contains what would have then been considered a strong feminist message. And it's important that at this later point in her career, Moyal no longer couches the message in terms of the needs of the family, as she had done in her newspaper earlier, but instead, She's saying that this is important, to educate women is important for the needs of society and the nation and even the broader region. And her rhetoric there really reflects the emerging Arab nationalist discourse. So if you look from her earlier feminist writings in the 1890s and compare them to these later feminist writings in the 1910s, you can see that there's really a shift. There's a clear progression from her earlier positions. In another lecture um, that was called Our, Our Renaissance, given in 1912 to a charitable society in Beirut, she passionately decries European expansionism and expounds the path forward for Arab Nahda or revival. So in this speech, Moyal exhorts her audience to renew the greatness of Eastern Arab civilization by embracing Arab cultural traditions 
in tandem with modern sciences and industry. So that reflects what we might call kind of like the you know, Arab revival orientation of her writings. But at the same time, for a brief period, Esther, her husband Shimon, and their friend um, Nisi Malul, who's another Palestine-based Sephardic writer, they co-founded a newspaper called The Voice of Ottomanism. And although it's called, it's, the title's slightly misleading because although it's called The Voice of Ottomanism, it's actually a newspaper that was meant, it was established to defend Zionist viewpoints in the Arabic press and to sort of counter the anti-Zionist rhetoric that was emerging in the local Arabic press at the time. But the newspaper didn't last very long because then the war breaks out, right? And so once the war broke out, the Ottoman authorities just shut everything down. And so that was the demise of the newspaper. But here's another um, image of the masthead. So this brings us to the war. And the First World War was a really, really terrible time in Ottoman Palestine. A lot of people left. There was a lot of hunger. It was just a terrible time. In early 1913, Shimon had been appointed an Ottoman medical officer. And so he was enlisted in the war. And unfortunately, he's killed in the war in 1915. So Esther is widowed. Following his untimely demise, the now widowed Esther departed with her younger children for Marseille, where she seemingly drops off the radar. So there is a frustrating lack of information about her time in France, although I'm still hoping to find some new information. So we don't have anything uh, by or about Esther from 1915 until 1936. So it's a full 20 years, right, when she's in France. The next definitive sign of life we have from her is 1936. She is listed in a directory in Palestine that shows her now living on, uh, this, in this very building in Tel Aviv. This is the building today. It's 3 Lillian Bloom Street in South Tel Aviv. So we know she comes back to Palestine. Don't know exactly when or why. But the following year, 1937, Esther sent a letter to Shlomo Dov Goitain, who's a very, very famous Jewish historian of medieval Judaism and Islam, the Cairo Geniza. And at this point, um, Goitain is based at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And so notice she writes the letter to him in Arabic, which is still the letter that she's, you know, the, most, the language that she's the most comfortable in. He himself is an Ashkenazi Jew, but is a scholar completely fluent in Arabic. So she sends him this Arabic letter, and she offers, to, she offers her services, basically. She wants to give a lecture at the university in Arabic. And I don't know that anything ever came of it, but we know that at this point she's still around and trying to do something with her expertise. And then that's it. Unfortunately, there's nothing more until seven years later in 1944 when she's visited by Yaakov Yoshua. Yaakov Yoshua is a scholar and journalist, also happens to be the father of the famous Israeli novelist, A.B. Yoshua. Now, um, Yaakov's report is bleak. He finds Esther seemingly abandoned and forgotten living alone in a poor neighborhood of Jaffa in obvious poverty. He reports that she is unable to recall the titles of the dozens of books that she had translated. And he writes, quote, after I brought up some fragmented memories of her life and times, I took leave of her. And in my heart was the feeling that I had walked amongst ruins and landslides, amongst broken souls that resented me for disturbing their rest after they had been forgotten by the dead and by the living alike. So a very dramatic and disturbing account of um, Esther in 1944. Now, I recently corresponded with a living descendant, Esther Moyal's grandson, Henry, who never knew her, but he was surprised that she would have been living in such a dire situation since he says that her eldest son, his father, was in fact a wealthy man who owned several buildings in Tel Aviv. So we don't know whether Yaakov Yoshua's account is embellished or whether for some reason Esther really was living in poverty. Maybe she had a falling out with her children. We just don't know. But in either case, Esther Azhari Moyal died in 1948, the very year of Israel's independence. And this date seems so deeply symbolic as an endpoint to her story. So while we don't yet know the reasons for this sad ending to what was such an accomplished life, I think we can guess at why she was forgotten for so long. So by 1948, Esther Moyal's life project was obsolete. She had left the Arab world behind because the old Palestinian society with its mix of Hebrew and Arabic cultures 
had been effectively partitioned, literally and metaphorically, partitioned into Jewish and Arab enclaves and effectively destroyed. The new Jewish state had moved in a completely different direction, both culturally and politically. So it was really not only until a few years ago that those of us who are deeply invested in learning about that old mixed society of early 20th century Palestine started digging into the lives of the Moyals and figures like them and realized her importance. And of course, there's still more to discover about her story, especially what she actually did while she was in Marseille, and hopefully time will help us fill in those gaps. So in conclusion, I want to highlight some of the implications of Esther's story. So I think first, um, no matter where you stand personally on the question of Israel and Palestine, it's noteworthy that Esther Moyal's positions don't map neatly onto today's binary positions. And by this, I mean that in her writings, as we saw, she's adamantly against European intervention in the Middle East. She's anti-imperialist, and she espouses a kind of you could call it a kind of regionalism, right, where she talks about the East, this kind of Eastern regionalism. But she's also fervently pro-Zionist. And this poses a contradiction for people who understand Zionism as an extension of European intervention or colonial politics. So what do we make of this disparity? Well, we should remember that she is writing, first of all, at a time, you know, she's, this is 1910, 1913 at the latest, the way that we understand you know, these different positions is very different now. First of all, it was much more fluid then. But secondly, she is writing at a time when Jewish intellectuals the world over were deeply troubled by the oppression of their brethren in the Russian Empire and troubled by things like the Dreyfus Affair, right? the Jewish question in Western Europe. So the Moyals believed in the core Zionist idea that persecuted, persecuted European Jews needed a refuge in Palestine. But again, they were also loyal Ottomanists who were not envisioning the creation of a Jewish state. So on the cultural level, Moyal's fluidity in moving between the Islamic heritage and Jewish topics and cultural references really shows us the distinctiveness of this Arab Jewish intellectual formation in that era. Right? This is the time of the modern Arab Renaissance. And second, as an intellectual, I think Esther Moyal epitomizes this kind of 19th century intellectual for whom literature, politics, and history forms a necessary and urgent whole. She translated Zola's works, and she wrote his biography. Because she was invested in Zola both as a writer and as an intellectual, whose political intervention really changed the course of history. Remarkably, Esther Mayal herself became a journalist and a literary scholar at a time when these categories were not readily available to women. So I find her a testament to the living importance and relevance of literature in public life. And on that note, I will close. So thank you for listening. people yourself, I think it's easier. Sure, yeah. Okay, I'm really happy to take questions. Yes? written between 1909 and 1913. So we'll wait for the plane. <laughs> So the, the traumatic way in which Jews left Arab countries differed from country to country. Um, I don't think there was really you know, a single case in which the entire collective of you know, Jewish population was outright expelled. 
But certainly in some countries, the majority of the population left under duress. Probably most notably, that would be the case of the Iraqi Jews, in which the majority of the population did leave. But that was not until 1950 to 1951. So it was much later. The Egyptian Jews kind of left piecemeal. They weren't expelled, but you know, some left after the Levon Affair in 1956, and then certainly because of Nasser's policies, getting into the late 50s and early 60s. So she's writing half a century, basically, before this happened. So she couldn't have foreseen that, right? I mean, essentially, she is writing at a time when Jews are still very much integrated into their societies in all of the you know, Muslim and Arabic speaking countries where they live. So there's no way that she could have foreseen what would happen. What happened was a result of the way that politics developed throughout the course of the 20th century, especially after the creation of Israel and the defeat of the Arab armies in 1948. So she, you know, not being a prophet, <laughs> doesn't know that all of this is going to happen. And at the moment that she's writing, she's still writing again as someone who's committed to the idea of Ottoman rule ensuring the greatest you know, possible equality. Because the, um, the Young Turk revolt had established, it kind of did away, well, it wasn't the only thing. There was kind of a system, there was a, uh, uh, a series of reforms throughout the 19th century in the way that the Ottomans dealt with its you know, religious minorities. And then it culminates with this reform, with this revolution in 1908, in which there's a kind of an idea of an imperial citizenship so that there's a nominal equality for Jews, Christians, and Muslims as Ottoman subjects. And so the Moyals are very taken with this, and they really see this as offering you know, the promise of equality and stability for Jews, Arabs, and Christians throughout the Ottoman Empire, of which Palestine is part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, information travels so quickly. I'm just trying to imagine how she lived in Palestine. How did her articles get? around the Arab world. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. So I mean, for me doing this research, what I'm continually impressed by is just how much information did travel and get around. And I think that we as you know, 21st century people have this notion that, well, you know, clearly these people lived before the age of the internet, and how did they know anything? But the stuff really got around. I mean, really, really got around. Like the Arabic cultural journals that I mentioned, people were reading them in Latin America, you know, because there was a large Syrian and Lebanese diaspora in the Americas, in North America for that matter, and stuff really traveled. So, you know, this is still a period where, you know, things are being printed, newspapers are shared, they're read aloud. So, you know, somebody will buy a newspaper, for every newspaper that's purchased, probably 20 people read it, but that's not like just they're sitting down and reading it individually, but, you know, lots of people are hearing it. And there are steamships, and, you know, people are moving across the Atlantic. People really traveled. So everything circulated, yeah, much more than we tend to imagine. Yes? It is, uh, thank you so much, very, very informative, and I, I, I got caught on your words, European intervention in the Middle East when presenting the life of Esse. I was born in North Africa, where, in fact, not only the European, but we can say the French, was a protectorat. We were a protectorat, French protectorat, or in Italy. What's the situation in North Africa comparing to the Middle East in terms of the presentation of such scholars or educated persons? I, I didn't learn Arabic, for example, right. because I, I couldn't be taught Arabic because I was a girl. Yes. yes. That means we had so many restrictions. Yes. At yes. least I can talk about Tunisia, but. Do we have a moyo in Tunisia? Yes, yes. That's, that's a great question. Um, this is something that I've been researching, is kind of the, the different ways that colonial language politics affected the trajectory of Jewish intellectuals in the Levant and North Africa. And it's a very different situation. So, um, OK, so first of all, we have to recall that um, at the time that she's writing, of course, North Africa is already fully colonized by France. Of course, Algeria is the most extreme example in terms of language politics. And so Arabic is very quickly destroyed as a cultural option for Jews in Algeria, whereas this process is much more gradual in Tunisia and Morocco. 
Tunis becomes the center of Judeo-Arabic publishing, actually. There's a huge Judeo-Arabic renaissance in Tunis and throughout North Africa, but Tunis is the biggest center of publishing. And that goes on until, surprisingly, until the 1930s. Even though the Tunisian, the French protectorate in Tunisia is established, I believe, in the 1870s. So um, Jews continue, although French, as those of you who are familiar with the writer Albert Memmi, the Tunisian uh, Jewish writer, French is a much more attractive cultural option for sort of Jews who are aspiring to you know, move up in society. But Arabic is still available to Jews. It's not like literally you know, the way it is in Algeria. I mean, you know, within the Jacques Derrida, the famous French philosopher, writes about how within a generation, you know, Jewish grandchildren in Algeria are unable to converse with their grandparents because the grandparents only speak Arabic and the grandchildren only speak French. And then Morocco, you know, has a much more sort of rich, heteroglossic kind of, you know, there are people who speak Berber, there's Arabic, there's um, a kind of Hebrew, small Hebrew Renaissance, there's Judeo-Arabic, but of course, again, the sort of upward trajectory for all North African Jews is you want to rise up socially, you learn French, and you align yourself with France. And this is done largely because of the educational mission of the Orient Islamique Universelle. It's a French Jewish network that is established in the 1860s, and it's, there are kind of these you know, French Jewish schools throughout the entire North Africa and the Middle East. Now, it's very different in the Levant for a couple of reasons. Okay, one is that you don't have the direct presence of you know, a French colonial administration. So um, there's Egypt, which is under some kind of nominal you know, British administrative control after the Suez Canal. There's like an economic sort of default. And then, so, so it's sort of, sort of colonized by Britain, but they're not imposing anything in terms of language. You have, you know, certainly France has interests in Lebanon and Syria, and so there's a French influence there, and there's French schools, and there's Orient. And Palestine is you know, something completely different. So, the British mandate starts only in the 1920s. The Britain is not interested in imposing its language on its uh, colonial subjects the way that France is. And of course, you have you know, the British colonial influence in Iraq after the war as well. But again, I mean, people are learning English, but it's not being imposed on them. So as a result, when Jewish intellectuals in Iraq really kind of modernize in the 20th century, it's in Arabic. And so you have a cluster of really prominent Jewish writers of Arabic in Baghdad, who are in fact kind of the avant-garde of the literary elite in Iraq, and they're Jewish, right? And then there's also a cluster of Jews in Egypt in the 20th century who are writing in Arabic alongside other Jews who are writing in French, and then, you know, same in Syria and Lebanon. So the short answer to this is that you really can't compare the dynamics in the eastern part of the Arab world, the Levant, and in North Africa, because the French colonial system was so much more kind of severe in the way it dealt with the you know, language politics of its subjects than the British were, or even sort of the French presence in the Levant. They just didn't, they didn't care as much there. And so that's why you don't see a kind of Esther Moyal in North Africa. Right? You see Jews writing mostly in French. But what you do see is a lot of um, newspapers. There are still newspapers in Judeo-Arabic, and there are people translating stuff into Judeo-Arabic. And that, that continues, like I said, mostly in Tunisia, even into the 1930s. May I ask a question? Yeah. Do you think that the poverty of the Jewish community, communities in North Africa, limited the introduction of the feminisms and the intervention of that's a really interesting question. I mean, maybe they were everywhere. You know, they weren't necessarily rich in Lebanon either. She came from a poor family. She just happens to be a kind of anomaly. But I think that, you know, the, the Arab feminism that Esther Moyal was contributing to was not aimed at Jewish communities. She was part of Arab feminism. She was, her rhetoric was all about Arab women. And so she, moves very fluidly between sort of positioning herself and identifying as an Arab woman and in other contexts when she's writing about Jewish issues, you know, kind of presenting herself as a Jewish authority. And so it depends, I think, on which audience she's addressing. But what is so fascinating about her is that she gives herself the authority and feels very comfortable to represent Arab women, although she's Jewish. And no one seems to have any problem with it, right? So it's a great question. I'm, I don't know how to answer it, but I'll think about that, actually. Yes? Thank you. 
I understand why you chose to write about Esther. It's kind of a fascinating story. But what led you to her? How did it come about that you even thought about finding her? I'm so glad you asked me that. <laughs> Thanks for giving me an opportunity to explain because um, I mean, I'm, I'm delighted to actually talk about where and how she came into my life as a scholar. Well, she's part of a broader project that I've been working on for many years, beginning with my dissertation work as a graduate student on these Jewish intellectuals who were between kind of Jewish and Arab societies and who wrote primarily in Arabic. And some of them also wrote in Hebrew or in other languages. But, you know, they were just kind of, they fell between the chairs, so to speak, for a long time. And these people were not really part of the more well-known narratives that we read when, you know, those of us who were students um, at the time, and I'm talking, you know, like my own training was in the 1990s and the early 2000s, if I picked up a history of the Arab cultural revival in the 19th century known as the Nahda, or a history of the Jewish, you know, enlightenment or cultural revival known as the Haskalah, you don't find any Jews from these Middle Eastern countries who are living in Islamic societies and writing in Arabic or Turkish or Persian. And they were just absent from the historical record. And so it was really, I was very curious and that was what I started researching. And, you know, because of the way it was at the time, they're pretty much all men. And then I heard about this one woman who had been mentioned, but there really wasn't much known about her. But she kind of turns up in some other scholarship that people have done on, you know, Arab feminists and here and there. And people always mention, oh, and she happened to be Jewish, you know, but it was kind of an aside. And then she turned up in a few other accounts. And so, you know, it was just a process of research where I went looking for her materials and trying to reconstruct her story as best as I could because I thought, wow, this is really fascinating that there's also a woman who was involved in this and how hard it must have been for her at a time when that wasn't supported. And in fact, you know, she had children and she had no material support you know, while she's trying to write, she didn't have time. And she complains about this in the introduction to the Zola book that she apologizes to the reader and she says, you know, if, if there are places where the book is repetitive or poorly organized, it's because we don't have the time and resources that would have been available to us had we been male. <laughs> she just says it, you know, outright. And you just imagine this 19th century woman with like four or five kids you know, not getting paid for any of her work probably doing all of this, it's really <laughs> remarkable. So I just found her story fascinating. Um, and I'm, I'm also happy to share the story of the book because I, I told Deborah earlier, it's, um, it was just a stroke of luck actually that I found her book. So I had seen it mentioned in a few places. And during the time I was conducting my research and this was, you know, before things were as widely available or through digitization, things are really different now. So I was doing my research in the early 2000s, mostly around 2003, 2004, and I was just, you know, hopping around the Middle East from library to library and archive to archive and in Paris and around the US. And I couldn't find this book. It was just not anywhere. And um, in Cairo, there is a neighborhood called Ezbekia where people sell used books. There's a used book market. And you know, people just kind of stand in this square and they there's like blankets on the floor literally with you know books just like laid out on the blankets. And you know, I just walked around from bookseller to bookseller saying, I'm looking for anything by Esther Moyal. And they all for some reason pronounce her name Morial. Don't ask me why. They say, Oh, Morial, Morial, okay, you know, give them a piece of paper with my cell phone number. And sure enough, this you know, young guy calls me back one, on one trip, and, and I'd been looking for it for years, and he said, I think I found it. And I met up with this guy, and he hands me this tattered, like dog-eared copy with a few pages torn in the middle, and says, you know, how's 20 guinea, which was like $4. <laughs> and I'm like, I've been looking for this book for five years. I couldn't believe it. It was like winning the lottery. So I have a, a physical copy of the book, and that's the first page. And as far as I know, it's the only copy left in the entire world. I mean, I've just not found it anywhere else. So, I mean, this tells you something about scholarship. Like, I present a lecture to you, and it just sounds like, OK, here's the story, here's the information, here's the material. But there's so much contingency involved. I mean, so much of it is just random luck, like what you find and what you don't find and when you find it. So 
you know, that's just kind of a side commentary on the work that we do. And are any of her children still alive? Well, well, I found a grandson and some distant relatives. And actually, I found them since I've been presenting, um, you know, this lecture. Um, I, you know, just in the course of the past year, there were a couple times I presented it virtually, and it was recorded. And so that was very helpful because then, you know, some people were able to catch it later. And so one descendant got in touch with me. Actually, two descendants, have, two descendants have gotten in touch with me recently, but one is her grandson, the son of her eldest son, who himself was a writer and poet. So that was very exciting, except that he never knew her. And apparently there was a family rift. So he doesn't even know much about her. And um, I did confirm that she was in Marseille with her younger children and uh, who, yeah, including um, his uncle, who then, okay, it's a long story, but in any case, they don't know what she did in Marseille. All I know is that she was there. I know what one of her younger sons ended up doing, but not her. So hopefully I'll find more. Okay, this side of the room, yes. Yeah. What are the yeah. questions? Yeah, is, 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 it, is it frustrating to you that you don't have a known image? It, oh, it's frustrating. And the other thing that's frustrating is that Esther Moyal was actually a very common name in this period because Moyal was a very common North African Jewish name and Esther is a very common name for Jewish women. And so there are tons of images floating around on the internet of Esther Moyal, but none of them are her. They're all slightly later. And so people are, you know, if you look on Wikipedia or if you look on various sites, now there's information, um, mostly from my research, of, you know, about her that's online with these pictures, but they're not actually of her. So just to be forewarned, yes. In the sense that it's such an amazing story, but the most unlikely part is the feminism, given the, the time and the place. So what was, what, what's your best guess as to the influence on her that, that made her a feminist? It doesn't look yeah, like yeah. it come from a about Right, right, right. I mean, <laughs> well, you know, I think actually what's, to me, just speaking from kind of what I understand of the period and the historical setting, what's interesting to me is why she was educated where she was educated and not in one of the Allian schools, which is what you would have expected to be the more likely place where a Jewish girl would be sent to be educated. So it's almost like she's some kind of fluke. I mean, I really have no idea how she ends up at what becomes you know, the American University in Beirut and why she ends up being educated in Arabic. You know, she could have just as well been educated mainly in French and become a French writer, but you know, she becomes an educated Arab woman and she just happens to be in the time and place when there are other educated Arab women who are coming together and really agitating for the right to an education and starting, you know, so there's a cluster of, you know, maybe a dozen women between <clears throat> the 1880s and like you know the up to 1920 who become writers editors translators and there's even some novelists so she's not unique and why you know arab feminism begins exactly then and there um i can't give you a good answer right now but there are other people who have studied this right and there are books about arab feminism and she just happened to be you know in beirut which was kind of the center and i guess she would have you know because she was at this institution, she would have found the other women who were you know, becoming educated and they came together and formed these like, societies, these literary societies that were like salons. So I think she just kind of happened to be in the right time and place and then she became part of that and generated you know, her own momentum and founded other societies and became you know, the secretary. So I guess you know, it's just kind of in the zeitgeist of the time and they're being influenced, these women read French, and they're being influenced by what's happening also in the West. Yes? This is the last question. You, you showed us two letters from uh, uh, to the Herald Tribune on Sunday yeah. Yeah. by Selim Serkis. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you told us all this wonderful uh, story about how Esther defined herself within the greater Arab Ottoman milieu. Mm -hmm. Uh, I assume Sekis, I mean, I looked him up a little bit. He seems to be quite a colorful character. <laughs> another talk. <laughs> but uh, I was wondering how did Esther interplay with other minorities within the Ottoman Empire? 
suggested, this must have been a naive yes. 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 Right. right. You know, I, all I can say to that is kind of in general terms, the, this period is known as sort of the most open and pluralistic you know, the, this Nahda movement, the Arab cultural revival, was one in which it's really um, a moment of great openness. And you really see this openness reflected in the journals, in the leading cultural journals of the time, where you see that all the different ethnicities in the empire, you know, are writing letters in Arabic. And that includes certainly Armenians who are Arabic speaking and other minorities. I don't know specifically how Esther herself as an individual interacted with them, but in general, it was a very kind of ecumenical moment that was very inclusive and accepting where there was kind of a redefinition of Arab identity on the lines of language and culture as opposed to religion. And so there are other ways in which people interacted as well, like some of the, you know, some of the men were also Freemasons. And the point is that it's a time in which, it's kind of a time of experimentation, right? And so I think this is really a way in which um, minorities who are themselves not Muslim are laying claim also to Arabic as their patrimony and the Arabic culture that you know is infused in Arabic throughout the Arabic language becomes their patrimony as well. That was what I was trying to show with you know how she quotes from the Quran in her writing. Okay, we'll bring this to a close. Thank you so much.